Welcome to our EMS uh, webinar today, December 11, 2012. Today, the session will focus on effective internal external communications and engagement strategies uh, related to implementing your environmental management system. And um, I'm glad you could join us today. We did have to reschedule from last week, so appreciate the uh, flexibility there. Um, today, we'll be uh, hearing from folks at the Stewardship Action Council. Uh, Ann Vogelmar uh, is the director uh, of the Stewardship Action Council. And this is a group that's been uh, organized to help uh, lead uh, action on improving social and environmental performance. And then uh, also joining Ann is Charlotte Valentine, who's the uh, program manager at the Stewardship Action Council and has been very active in helping lead that organization forward nationally. So again, welcome. I wanted to just remind folks that um, there's a little chat box uh, where you can queue up questions. Uh, Angela Miller from the National P2 Roundtable will be running the slides today and be monitoring uh, any questions you have. Folks are on, on, on mute today. We are recording this and we'll be putting this up on a website for uh, future reference. And hopefully, uh, the whole series will be something that you can use as you uh, develop your EMS or are trying to make uh, Im improvements. So let's kick it off. First slide. Uh, just to quick overview this series, it, really this has been uh, an interesting and, and useful series for ecology to present. Uh, we started back in September with sort of an introduction uh, from the National P2 Roundtable. Next slide. And then uh, we've been focusing on uh, EMS implementation for the last two series. Today we're going to focus on, again, communications and engagement. Finish up the year, next slide, we'll be moving into uh, EMS auditing. And uh, we'll be working with uh, Dennis Sasserville with the auditing roundtable. And we've got a date scheduled there for the upcoming session on EMS auditing uh, January 22nd. I believe that will begin at 11 o'clock Pacific time as well. And I've outlined here basically what we'll be looking at in terms of preparing for an audit, understanding the auditors, the qualifications, um, things like that. And then the second one to wrap up the series is um, a summary on audit reporting, evaluations, and engaging management review in that process. Next slide. So I usually start these off with just a reminder that the Department of Ecology does offer an alternative to environmental management systems uh, to meet the P2 planning requirements. And the basic message here is that uh, we want to work with uh, businesses that are uh, interested in developing an EMS or already have one in place. We have several companies that have been longtime participants in the program, and we appreciate their commitment to uh, environmental management systems. Next slide. Again, um, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, we have regional staff in each of our four offices throughout Washington State. And uh, we have specialists that are assigned to each company. And uh, you hopefully will have some type of a, a relationship with our regional staff. And so you can talk to them about EMS and how that might fit into your uh, organizational objectives. and and uh, there's some basic paperwork that's required to submit to us. Next slide. And it includes uh, hosting an EMS site visit. And uh, we will require that facilities uh, conduct a periodic assessment. Um, our standard is basically one every five years, but we found that um, typically that's a long time to go. So there's uh, you know, recommendations for at least every three years for we're doing a major assessment or some type of annual review. We do have an annual progress report that we're uh, using to report through our new turbo plan. Um, and uh, that's a new system that was just launched this year. And hopefully, we'll have additional enhancements to um, support the EMS program as well. Next slide. Um, this is just a basic uh, summary of our criteria when we're looking about environmental management systems. 
the three areas in terms of having a policy, addressing implementation, and then how you go about monitoring and measuring um, your program. Next slide. So let's put up our quick uh, poll for the day. And uh, because we're talking about communications and engagement, well, I was kind of curious whether any organizations out there now are starting to use social media to share EMS results or successes. This might be something that you put out through your own company, or you may put a tweet out or something on Facebook or some of these other um, social media platforms. Um, and there's a variety of reasons maybe you want to do that. So if you go ahead and select um, one of these items, we'll get our quick poll back. Um, and Angela will run that for us. Wow, interesting. Um, so one of the thoughts to think about, and we'll go into the next slide, is um, addressing communications. And I wanted to just share with you an example of what we've done at the Department of Ecology recently. We've had um, sort of a working EMS within the agency. Um, it evolved into a sustainability report. And just about a month ago or less, we put out a um, sustainability report called the Global Reporting Initiative. Next slide. And you know, we we looked at this as an opportunity uh, to sort of walk the talk as we develop our own sustainability programs here at, the, at our agency. It also provided a real platform to to bring our employees into the conversation. Um, and we're moving into into the sustainability realm, which brings in both environmental and social and economic. Um, aspects into the program. It is focused again on continuous improvement like EMS. And uh, we've been involved with the Global Reporting Initiative for quite a few years. We're a, a stakeholder in that. It's a global reporting system. And, it's, and it is growing um, now with more than 4,700 organizations uh, producing these types of reports. Um, next slide. Um, just a quick summary of how we've organized this uh, in terms of the organizational aspects of our agency uh, includes things. There's requirements uh, under the GRI to meet certain standards. And you can see there kind of where we started now to incorporate both environmental, labor, social, and, and economic impact. Next slide. So one of the things that we we did was we produced this report, and we had a communication strategy around that, um, both internally and externally. And our kind of hook for the external uh, media was that we are the first state environmental agency to uh, issue a sustainability report under the GRI. And uh, basically, we're sharing that you know it's integrating sustainability into our decision making employee education, and looking at our overall impacts uh, from our agency operations. Next slide. And some of the key elements is that it does highlight our activities to reduce waste, improve our efficiencies, engage stakeholders, and promoting what we call lean innovation. Um, our agency has really taken lean uh, to heart, and we have quite a few initiatives underway to help improve our, our practices here at the agency. Next slide. So here's some of the things you can think about as you talk about, think about communication. We did put a report together with on a website. Uh, it's printable. People can look at it. We communicated with the governor's office. The governor has a, a weekly alert so that our senior management knew that, that this was going on. We did issue a press release um, using our media listservs and business journals. Next. Um, we also have, in the world of social media now, a uh, blog. So it's kind of like you can't just put out a press release anymore. It doesn't really go anywhere. Um, so having additional social media 
uh, targeted emails. Um, so you do have to really think about your audience and what you're trying to accomplish. And it, you know, some folks might say, well, this is just sort of self-promotion, you know, kind of thing. But um, on the other hand, we're trying to, you know, get the word out about these types of, um, of programs. Lead, again, leading by example, supporting the effort out there, and companies are in a competitive market as well. And so, working within your supply chain, uh, working uh, with your vendors. Um, you know, you might think about how you could take your EMS work and begin to move that out a little bit more into the market. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just a screenshot of an article we did inside of Ecology. This is our employee newsletter. Next slide. And um, there are various blogs out there that we were able to put the story out, and then it gets picked up by folks that um, are interested in these topics. And so, you know, try to create a little buzz around things. But uh, so that's kind of a quick story on um, how we've approached this. You know, as you know, a heck of a lot of work just goes into producing um, the system, maintaining it, working internally. But you do need to start thinking about, well, how do I you know, sort of tell the story about this. And ecology, we're always trying to figure out a way. How do we how do we tell the story on on our successes um, and help get the word out to folks more broadly? All right. So that's a quick quick summary. I want to turn it over to, to Anne and Charlotte, who are going to take us through the rest of the presentation. And again, um, feel free to think about questions and use the uh, chat box as we go through the presentation. And including any questions for me, and we'll take those at the end. So, Anne? Uh, thanks, Ken. This is Charlotte. I'm going to go ahead um, okay. and talk about um, the Stewardship Action Council a little bit and then turn it over to Anne for um, the uh, presentation. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, uh, okay. So. Um, and so this is what we're going to be discussing today. And then um, next slide. All right. So um, the Stewardship Action Council is the organization that um, Anne and I are with. It's a nonprofit uh, membership organization dedicated to improving social and environmental performance. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and our members represent um, a variety of different communities, including academia, state government, non-government organizations, investment, industrial, and um, service sectors. Our, and our members commit to working together to improve their performance, share their successes and challenges, and increase their influence um, through the belief that we can accomplish more together than we can um, individually. Um, as part of our effort to further collaboration among our members, uh, we have an updated map on our website that shows uh, the location of all of our members. Um, and uh, from that, we have been able to pursue an initiative in Indiana that is um, trying to protect habitat, support biodiversity, and increase educational opportunities. Um, so an important part of the Stewardship Action Council is uh, recognizing and sharing uh, successes and challenges. Um, so while most, uh, almost everyone said that they are not on social media today, one of the things that um, SAC does is um, recognize the successes of our members at the corporate or facility level, uh, which means that we post um, best management practices or better management practices on our members only website. And um, we do an annual report and it's public, and we have a presence on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn where we can um, highlight the accomplishments of our members, and um, this, uh, which can include EMS um, successes and um, or challenges and, and, and stories shared. Um, so uh, we see recognition of success as not just a pat on the back, but also an opportunity for other members to um, learn from uh, from the success of their peers, uh, since everyone is on, on different levels in the path towards sustainability. 
Um, so if you'd like to learn more about us, you can go to Stewardship Action Council, stewardshipaction.org or send Anne or I an email. Our contact information will be at the end of the presentation. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Anne, SAC's Executive Director. Thank you, Charlotte. All right, next slide. Okay, for those of you that were involved in the first uh, webinar that we conducted, some of these slides will look familiar. We're just going to spend a couple quick minutes going over um, the, the, uh, some main points about environmental management systems. Um, one of the things is that you want to make sure your employees understand is that almost no matter what position they hold within their or your organization, they have a role to play. You are going to identify your aspects and impacts. You're going to identify objectives and targets. And what you will find as you go through the implementation of the system is that there are roles for many different people within your organization to play. And the effectiveness of each of those individuals is critical. If one fails, it's a cascading effect, and other elements of the system will fail as well. So it is important that your employees understand that every, every person in your organization, um, almost regardless of what position they hold, has a critical role to play in the environmental management system. Next slide. The purpose of an EMS, um, there, there are a number of different drivers for it. There, some are external, some are internal. The ones that will trigger you to be interested in environmental management system will be your, unique to your organization. You may have a corporate office that is dictating it. You may have um, external drivers that are encouraging it. You may have a regulatory department that is encouraging it. What you will find is that the environmental management system will assist in maintaining compliance if it's done well. It will help to drive continuous improvement. Um, and in the state of Washington, as Ken mentioned, there's a, there's a P2 um, planning element. The, one of the critical points about an environmental management system um, is that I have seen environmental management systems that look fantastic on paper and on the ground are essentially non-existent. Likewise, you can see an environmental management system that is phenomenal on the ground, but the documentation about it is limited or inaccurate. And as you're implementing the system, you want to make sure that you have both elements, that you've got the functionality on the ground, but that you also have the documentation to be able to demonstrate what is happening and what needs to be happening and to be able to show that it is happening. Next slide. If you don't have a system in place, you're going to see problems recurring. You're going to see um, a, what I tend to call a hero, someone who holds things together. But if they disappear, things don't get done. Um, you're going to see inefficiencies. You're going to feel as though things are uh, constantly sort of getting ahead of you. Um, and what an environmental management system can do is help you get ahead of the curve. Um, plan, identify the problems, resolve the problems, make them go away, and continue to drive you to improved performance. Next slide. An organization that has a strong EMS is going to be, have a consistent approach to things. There's going to be continuous improvement happening across the board. Mistakes will be caught early before they become bigger, and they won't recur. Um, change will be easier. When you make a change within your organization, your, your folks will be able to adapt to it more easily with a strong environmental management system in place. Folks will understand their role, and people will be able to back one another up. Next slide. OK. Um, just very briefly, the four elements of an environmental management system, we've gone through these before, so I'm not going to reinvent them here. Um, the important part for today is that we will be talking about communication, community outreach, and training and awareness under the implementation phase. Next slide. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, back one. Oh, no, forward one. Sorry. OK, so the first thing we're going to talk about is communication. And when you're thinking about communication within your organization, you want to think about what systems you have in place to report on environmental performance. There are two elements, obviously, internal communication and external communication. Focusing on internal first, you want to make sure that senior management is provided with information that's up to date and current and that you have a mechanism to do that. And you want to make sure that you have, in terms of external communication, you want to make sure that you have a consistent way to respond to external inquiries about your organization. Could be neighbor complaints, could be customer inquiries, but a consistent process for responding to those um, inquiries will prove to be w useful for you. So you want to think about what processes you have in place for responding to external inquiries that you may get. Um, and then lastly, what communications that you have with external stakeholders 
how do you do that? Um, local community leaders, it may be schools, it may be chambers of commerce, um, it may be neighbors that you have. What are the mechanisms that you have for communicating with them? And how do you let them know what you're working on, how you're progressing? Um, if you're doing phenomenal things, you want your community to know about it. So you want to think about how you go about communicating that information. Next slide. Okay, so communicating internally, again, two main groups that you're going to try to communicate to. One is staff, one is management. Um, the content that you're communicating will be different, and thus the methods that you communicate will be different. Um, for staff, you can do staff meetings, intranet if you have it. You can do it through trainings, tailgates, all hands meetings. Um, you can do it through memos. What works is going to be dependent on your organization. If you have shift, um, shift work, then Tailgate sessions can be a very effective way of getting key information out to people. Um, if it's an operation that runs 9 to 5, then an all-hands meeting or a, or a uh, message through an intranet may be able to suffice. For management, it's, it's, a little, it's a little different because they're not as interested in the programs or processes that you have in place. They're not as interested in what requirements you have to comply with. They want to know that you've got the system in place to do it and that you're able to meet those, the changes or, or the needs that you have and you're able to meet the targets that they've set. So the information that you're communicating to them is different and thus the, the um, mechanism that you'll use to communicate to them will be different. Next slide. Um, with internal communication, especially around an EMS, you want to have employee support for your EMS. Um, you want to help them to understand why the environmental management system is needed and how it's going to assist them in doing what they're doing. Um, it may be beneficial, and organizations that have done this I have seen be very successful, to tie the environmental management system to a performance appraisal or a bonus. So if you're in the process of trying to meet objectives and targets, link the bonus that your employees get to their ability to meet those targets or to implement the system. Provide recognition for folks that are successful in this or provide some sort of reward. Um, linking it to what the employees care about helps significantly to ensure that they're going to care about it too. Um, methods for gaining employee support can be classroom or computer-based training. Um, the organization that I used to be with developed a computer-based training program that every employee was required to take. It, dictated, it detailed what we were doing, why we were doing it, what goals we were setting, what responsibilities individual people had, um, what to do if they had a question. And it was, it was that organization's way of introducing the EMS and then introducing changes that occurred within the EMS. Um, you can also use meetings or tailgates. Um, and I would, I would strongly recommend appointing a dedicated and energetic individual that can help to drive and support the EMS. Um, in terms of employee support, it's best if you keep it as simple as possible. Um, you want to communicate what they need to know, um, but you don't want to overwhelm them with it because there are a lot of details to an EMS that not all individual employees are going to need to know. Next slide. Examples of employee engagement, uh, I'm going to point to one of our members, and that is 3M. I uh, did speak with them ahead of time um, to make sure that they were comfortable with me presenting this slide to you. This is one of the slides that they've presented to our SAC members in a webinar that they did for our members. For those of you that are familiar with 3M, they have a program called Pollution Prevention Pays. They have implemented 8,400 projects since 1975. And these are employee driven. Um, any employee can participate. The projects are recognized by senior leadership. Um, and they've developed an employee education program around pollution prevention pays stemming out of it that goes to a sustainability speaker series. They have an internal newspaper, a sustainability newsletter. So they've really taken um, their pollution prevention pays program and expanded it to continue to ensure that new projects are identified, employees are engaged, and the folks that are engaged are recognized. Um, it's an incredibly successful program. They, they share information with people about how much um, pollution they've been able to avoid, dollars saved. Um, and that changes time over time. So we haven't included that information here. What they said in terms of engaging their employees was it was incredibly important to link efforts directly to your company's values, goals, and principles. So whatever your senior management cares about and articulates on a regular basis 
if you can link this particular program that you're implementing um, or what you're trying to communicate to your employees about what, they, what you're trying to accomplish to what, they're, what the executive leadership is saying they care about, you're going to get your employees more engaged. Um, they did say you want to make sure that you give um, your employees permission to innovate and you provide tools and opportunities. Um, communicate through the newsletter and, and that will assist in getting employees engaged as will the recognition. Next slide. Another example of an employee engagement program, um, and this is communicating around the need for continuous improvement. This was an energy company that developed a footprint reduction program. They did tie it to part of the company bonus. Um, they required annual environmental improvements linked to individual facilities footprints. Um, the projects had to be approved by senior management, and they were listed in detail on a company intranet. And the next slide that I'm going to share with you will show you some of the savings that they were able to achieve. Um, their recommendations for engaging your employees were to create comp competition within and across sites and to tie the program to employee review, pro performance appraisal, or bonus, communicate about the program often, um, and visibly and provide tools and opportunities for folks to collaborate. Next slide. This is a quick, just a quick snapshot. This is just one page. Um, there were, I would say, over 100 projects implemented over a period of three years. You can see the savings that they were able to accomplish here. Um, next slide, and I am going to quickly talk about one other, um, one other example before I move on, and I don't have a slide on this. It's a, one of our members, Toyota facility in Indiana, um, has been participating with a outside organization around educating students on water. Um, this particular facility is very interested in water, and so they've linked their community engagement activities to that topic. They involve over 2,000 students a year um, on poster projects, on water sampling, posting water sampling data. It's a phenomenal program. Um, one that will be the focus of the next SAC webinar. And if you guys are interested in participating in that webinar, you can just send a quick email to either Charlotte or myself. We'll add you to the mailing list. That webinar is going to be taking place in January. OK, so now we're moving on to communicating externally. Um, and the first question you want to ask yourself is, who do you want to communicate with? Because the communication mechanisms that you use are going to be different depending on who you are communicating with. Um, if you're communicating with the community at large, um, you may want to consider some sort of sustainability report. Um, also a good mechanism for social investment groups, SRIs, or other interested parties. Um, but you want to make sure that the report is communicating on the topics that those entities are interested in. So there is something called a materiality assessment where you determine what issues are, are important or material to your company who your stakeholders are, what they care about, and then target the report to what they care about. Um, the report that Ken mentioned earlier, the GRI report, is a really good way to do this. One thing I would, I would strongly mention is the companies that I have worked with over the years, while you start doing a GRI report for the purposes of communicating externally, and you want to communicate good and bad, it needs to be balanced, so you want to communicate about your challenges as well as your successes. But what you'll find if you start to undertake that process is that the value of the report is much more internal to the organization than it is external to the folks that you are communicating with. And the reason for that is that as you start preparing the report, you're asking yourself questions about how do we do this or why aren't we doing that. And what you'll find and what I've seen people, organizations that I've worked with over the years find is that the, the report writing process actually starts to drive internal improvements. Um, it's fascinating. You would think that the report was being produced for reporting's sake, but in every instance, every organization I've worked with, that ends up not being the case. Um, it ends up being much more of an internal driver for, for performance improvement. So it is a great tool. Um, you do want to think about what you want to communicate, um, performance goals, general information about the facility. Again, you do want to be very, you want to be as transparent as you're comfortable being about your challenges as well. Um, communication mechanisms other than a report that are available to you could include a press release if it's about a particular project, um, an open house if you want to share information about your entire organization, an open house is a good way to do it, um, information through your website, um, the uh, community project you can use as a way to communicate with your, with your local community. 
um, or a third-party communication on your behalf. Um, an organization like ours who does do an annual report, who highlights the successes that you have had at your facility in our report and on your behalf is another way to communicate externally. Next slide. Okay, the second point I really want to focus on or make about communication is that communication really should be two-way. It's not just about you telling people about your facility. You want to find out from your stakeholders what they care about, and you want to communicate with them about those topics. It's a phenomenal way for you to learn um, things that they care about, things that you can improve that will improve your relationship with your community. So you want to tailor your communications to areas of stakeholder interest, and you really do want to try to get as much information about what they care about, um, information about you know, their concerns, and then ensure that you respond. Next. OK, community outreach. Um, if shared interests exist, you want to look for ways to work together. Um, a good example is, is the Toyota facility in Indiana. Um, there were interests and, and common interests around water, around teaching students about water. And so Toyota was able to create an, a community outreach program that provided educational benefit to the community and to the students, as well as benefit to them. Um, another example is an energy company sponsoring energy savings programs for customers, or a healthcare company that might train um, and, or sponsor training programs for nurses. Next slide. OK, moving on to training. Um, this is probably self-explanatory, but the benefits of training uh, are, are to ensure that all of your employees know what's required and know the proper way to carry out what you're asking them to do. Um, it also ensures that each employee knows how their actions or the, the job that they are undertaking can impact the environment. So a, a training module could be online or could be done in person about what your environmental management system is attempting to do why it's important, um, if it isn't implemented or done well, what the consequences of that are, can really help employees to understand why you're asking them to do what you're asking them to do. Um, you can also use this a training as a way to communicate the consequences of improper actions. Often employees may not clearly understand what the, what the ramifications can be if something isn't done well or done correctly. Next slide. OK, when you're developing a training program for your employees, uh, there are a couple key questions that you want to think about. Um, first is, how do you identify and document your training needs? Um, the, the training that, if you're like a lot of the organizations that I've worked with, can be very, um, th there can be a lot of very different training that needs to be done. There can be health and safety training. There can be ethics training. There can be environmental compliance training. Um, and who gets what can be very different, depending on the roles that the individuals play. So you want to make sure you have a, a very good mechanism to both identify who needs what training and then to document that they've had it. And I'm going to share a spreadsheet on the next slide that one of the organizations that I've worked with has used. Um, the next thing that you want to make sure is that you want to ensure that all individuals that have roles and responsibilities that could create a significant environmental impact have received the training that they need um, to ensure that they're aware of those how those impacts can occur and what they can do to, to avoid them, as well as what they can do if to respond if something does occur. Um, so you want to make sure you can track who's received the training that it's current. Um, you want to make sure that you get people that were absent the day a training was offered, make sure that they, they are able to get it after the fact. Um, you need to think about new employees and what EMS training you want them to have compared to those that may have transferred between departments. You also want to look for ways to measure how effective the training was. And that's going to vary depending on the type of training that you're offering. Um, and lastly, you, you do want to ensure that individuals that are out there are competent to perform their assigned responsibilities. So um, if someone's changing a role or somebody's new to a role, how do you know that they really have the skill set and the knowledge that they need to be able to perform that, that task successfully? Next slide. Okay, this is, a, this is a template, one of the organizations I work with. This is something that they had put together to track the training that they're doing. Um, it indicates by position who needed to have it, how frequently it needed to be done, um, the training itself and a regulatory reference or a company manual reference. The franchise manual is a company policy for this organization. Um, it did require certain training, and they use this, this spreadsheet to track that training. Next slide. 
Okay, um, that brings us to the end of the training. Um, contact information is here on the slide. Uh, again, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about or would like some additional information, please feel free to give me a ring. You can reach me at the number here or by email. Uh, and that, that brings us to the end. Ken? Thank you, Anne and Charlotte. Um, so we do have an opportunity for any questions or follow-up from folks today that are on, on the line. Um, one of the questions I had, Anne, and so go ahead and use your chat box for that. Uh, one of the questions I had is for smaller organizations, um, do you have some thoughts on how, how to address that? I know, I know we referenced some you know, large efforts like Ecology and Toyota and others, um, but if you're a smaller organization, um, are there any tips on where you might focus your efforts um, within the organization, or how do you sort of start off with something? For communication? Yeah. Um, it, small organizations are going to be probably fairly well integrated into the communities that they're in. You guys may sponsor a, um, a baseball team or local football team. There will be chambers of commerce that you're engaged in, local organizations. Your employees will have, um, have contact to the, in the community. Um, Many of the, one of the companies that I've worked with, a, a small organization, lots of facilities around the world, but, but a small company, um, started with community action panels um, where they invited uh, leaders in the community, teachers, um, other folks that were in the community to, to come and talk to them at, an, at a, a meeting about the issues or the concerns that they might have around the company or things that they would like to see the facility doing. They used that, um, that as a driver locally to, to change some of the things that they were doing. Some of the, some of the changes were around transportation, um, times that vehicles came in, um, horns that sounded at the facility and, and changing some of them so that, so that they didn't sound externally, they only sounded internally, dust control, that kind of thing. Um, the facility was operating completely within the regulatory requirements that, that were applicable to it. Um, but the local community had um, ideas or, or concerns about how that particular facility could be a, could be a better community partner. And they, they extracted that information through the community action panel. Um, you can also just go out, go to the Chamber of Commerce meeting, go to a school, go to um, you know, a high school event, and just talk to folks that are in the community, um, you know, one to one, one on one, extracting information that, that um, they feel if you're living in the community and, and it's a small business, then you're going to have those mechanisms open, um, communication mechanisms available to you just as a, as a function of living in the community. Um, and take advantage of those. Um, ideas that people have, bring back to your management. You know, say, this, you know, this came from the community. It's something they care about. Can we do something about this? Um, and, and take it that way. The, as far as the reporting goes, um, instead of a full-blown report, you might want to just do a flyer. Um, you know, one-page flyer that had information about your organization on one side and goals that you had set or targets that you had set that you were working on on the other that visitors to your facility could take. So it's, it's a way of saying, hey, you know, you may not work with us, but we want you to know we're making these efforts to reduce water or to reduce waste or um, to improve, you know, health care training for our employees or whatever it is that you're interested in communicating. Um, and extract the information from the local community through the mechanisms or the routes that are available to you. Okay. Uh, Angela, did we have another question come in? Uh, yes. How would you compare an EMS with a GRI report? Why should a company invest resources in one over the other? Ken, do you want to field that one, or do you want me to take a first pass? Good question. Um, why don't you why don't you jump in, and then I'll uh, maybe have a couple things. Okay. Um, an environmental management system is targeted primarily. I mean, by its name, it's environmental. So you're looking for your aspects and impacts. You're looking for the aspects of your um, operation that can be improved over time, reducing you know, the materials that you use or the waste that you generate or the water. Um, the, the GRI report really 
it, it very well um, balances that. Not balances that. It, it's a synergy. Um, many of the things that you're doing under your environmental management system, you would report on in a GRI report. The way the GRI works, um, and I'm, I don't want to get too complicated because there's a lot to it, but there are basically three levels that you can report under, um, A, B, and C. Um, the GRI has 80 plus indicators in the environmental, social, and economic categories. Um, and at the base level, level C, you report on 10. Um, you report on some that are environmental, some that are social, some that are economic. Um, there are probably things, if you have an environmental management system, many of them may link to what you're already doing. And what you'll find when you start looking at the GRI, if you have internal buy-in to produce a report, you really will start to, the, you'll find the report is a driver for continual improvement that goes beyond environmental. It'll drive environmental improvement, but it'll, it'll, it'll um, encourage you to look at um, training for your employees. It'll encourage you to look at labor issues, diversity, um, supply chain. It, it, it asks questions about things that as you look at those questions and you look at your competitors and how they're responding to them, it can help to either identify you guys as a leader in, in the industry that you're in or, or the area that you're in, or it can really help to start to highlight some areas that improvement would be warranted in. Um, and so you start with your environmental management system. It's what we know. It's easier. It's environmental. And then the GRI will, will encourage you to look beyond environmental and will enable you to communicate and highlight what you have done environmentally and in other areas as well. Ken, anything to add? Um, well, for, for ecology, we uh, had a, actually a little grant from US EPA to, to develop this, we had a long history with environmental management systems going back to like 1996 when, when EMS first sort of arrived on the scene and, and there was a lot of activity in that. And internally there's been an interest in sustainability and what, what our role as an agency uh, should be going forward. And so it was a learning opportunity for us to kind of go through that process. Uh, it has generated a lot of internal discussion um, across the agency, whereas things can tend to stovepipe within a large organization. So it's really opened up the lines of communications, I think, in a differently sort of fundamental way. A lot of the indicators that we selected were data that we actually had, um, for example, like our diversity rates and hiring practices was down in the HR department, but no one had kind of reached down there to engage and pull, pull that information together across the organization. Um, a lot of times, the work that our facilities people do to run our buildings, to run the motor pool, to, to do the work that work on where we have LEED certified buildings, a lot of that stuff never, they didn't get a lot of recognition for that. So it, create an opportunity for them to um, highlight some of those types of achievements. And we depend on a lot of the data from, from those folks. Um, where we sit in the organization, we're helping to you know, promote uh, sustainability and things like that, but we don't actually sort of maintain the data and the day-to-day -day kind of stuff. You know. um, and I think the other thing out there is that Things are continuing to evolve in the marketplace. There are other standards out there besides GRI and others. Um, there seems to be more interest from, say, the Wall Street you know, investment community. Um, around this, uh, there's pressures within the supply chain. Um, I, I think as a small organization, if you were you know, if you're a supplier to a large multinational corporation, or maybe you're, you want to get into that market, you know, having a basic EMS with a flyer, a one-pager about what you're doing, I think, is a, a good step in the right direction. And then we've also had, you know, organizations that put their EMS in place. They may have been the first one within their 
um, industry or their trade group, and they've been able to bring that into the into that 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 group and sort of help green that area. For example, we have a company that uh, makes cabinets here in the Northwest. Uh, they've been a, a strong environmental leader, and they were able to take that and share that across the industry, so that you know everyone's trying to become more green. So they, you know, other folks won't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, and they can learn from their experience, and uh, you know, help keep their their sector um, competitive. Um, so there's lots of reasons, and uh, it, it's sort of done in this spirit of continuous improvement and this whole idea of sort of taking a systems approach to the work we do. Plus, you know, finally I think ecology, we have a lot of stakeholders and how can we continue to be effective with that or, or do a better job with stakeholder engagement as a large, you know, public agency. You know, besides the traditional, you know, we issue rules, we have comment periods, uh, we do public meetings. Um, and you know now as we move into more of the social media, how do we start to use some of those tools to bring more people into the kind of the things that we're working on? So that's a few random thoughts. Um, anything the else? The other thing, as far as GRI is concerned, the other thing that I would point out um, is that it it did start, um, the early adopters did tend to be the big companies. If you do go to, it's globalreporting.org, it's the GRI website. Um, and they do, companies can choose to list their reports on that website. So it isn't comprehensive. It doesn't have every report that every company has ever done on GRI. Um, but it has a good chunk of them. And um, what you will see, uh, and what the data is showing, I recently did a presentation down in Kentucky for their Governor's Excellence um, Conference. And I was asked to look at what the trend is um, around global reporting and around sustainability, around CSR. And what the data shows when you go out and look for it is that you know, five, 10 years ago, it was, it was a handful of companies doing this. Um, and what has happened in, in you know, recently, um, interviews that have been done with CEOs of large and medium-sized businesses worldwide, um, sustainability is um, no longer sort of a buzzword, but it is something that you have to consider um, when you are conducting your operations. Um, it has a global reach, uh, and where it used to be just you know a handful of large companies that were doing it, now it's 95% of the Fortune 500s and something like 80% of the um, mid size companies that are looked at in some of these surveys that are producing these reports. So it's gone from being something that, that larger companies did to really starting to have a foothold with, with smaller organizations as well. Um, and that data is out there and it's available. And if anybody's interested in some of the, some of the data slides that we have, I'd be more than happy to make those available as well. Um, but it, the trend is really to more and more and more companies adopting um, not only EMSs but, but GRI reporting and CSR programs. Yeah, whereas I think EMS is a good place to start because it is facility-based. Um, and I know that in terms of GRI, a lot of that kind of gets rolled up into one sort of giant corporate report. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be one of the criticisms with with GRI is sort of how do you tease out sort of individual uh, performance within a large organization. Um, Ceres had the facility reporting project. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody is familiar in that, about, with that or if you have interest in producing a facility level report. But Ceres took a pass at a facility level report. Lockheed Martin piloted it along with some others. Um, and I believe that information is still on their website if you're interested in trying to track that down. Mm -hmm. And wh one of the things we've talked about at Ecology is that you know we've had this EMS alternative available for quite a quite a long time, uh, but there are other tools out there. We're wondering if that um, if we sort of extended the idea to other things like GRI or other standards. Um, you know, would our P2 planners you know, want to see that, um, give them more flexibility and um, implementing systems that work within their organization. So, uh, you know, 
our EMS isn't tied to any one particular standard, although it's based off of sort of the ISO 14001. Um, but we don't require any you know, particular standard. So you know, one of the things we looked at is whether we could um, update our policy to allow for additional reporting systems to still meet the, the intent of the P2 planning law. Um, so that would be something that we're going to be looking at over the next year or so. Angela, any other questions that have come in? Uh, that's it. We're coming up on about the top of the hour. Again, uh, thank you, Anne and Charlotte, as well as Angela Miller at the National P2 Roundtable for uh, hosting the webinar. And this will conclude our series on implementation. Uh, thank you, Anne and Charlotte, and uh, looking forward to continuing to work with the Stewardship Action Council. And um, appreciate your time, and thanks for the attendees. Um, any questions, just uh, send us an email. I'd be glad to uh, follow up with any individual questions. We also will be posting all this information, websites and presentations to um, the uh, Ecology website uh, that has EMS information on it. And I believe our next uh, webinar will be uh, January 22nd uh, for EMS auditing. So until then, uh, safe holidays, and we'll see you next year. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.